So, um, hello to everybody out there in Argentina. Uh, my name is Ravi Purushatma and I work here in the Education Arcade group at MIT as well as the Learning Games Network as a video game designer and researcher. So, so far our group at MIT has done a series of video games for all sorts of different educational purposes. We've done physics, biology, immunology, mathematics, programming, uh, logical thinking, uh, all sorts of different fields. Uh, but we've only just started to move into trying to think about how to do video games for foreign language learning. And we've been noticing just continually how different it is from other disciplines and all the different ways we need to think about foreign language learning. Um, and as I understand, pretty much everybody at this conference is a background in some way or another to language learning. Uh, mostly teachers, some researchers, as I gather. Although, from what I've heard, it's not a whole lot of video games people there. And so I thought that maybe I could just share some of these perspectives that uh, we've been encountering as we've been trying to fit together video games and foreign language learning. And hopefully that might be of use to your different fields of work in language learning. So you'll have to forgive me here. I'm not entirely familiar with kind of all the standard practices in Argentina. So a lot of the, this talk is going to be based on uh, my experiences working with the curriculums here in the US. Uh, which I'm sure have a lot of differences with the way ESL is taught there. But hopefully there's at least some similarities and some of their perspective and issues that uh, we encounter will be of interest and raise some thoughts and spark some interesting discussion around that. So I guess with that, here in the U.S. at least, uh, one of my main concerns has always been uh, how far behind our homework has been and how it's completely not evolved ever really. We've seen just huge advances in conferences where we can get together and talk about you know, how to make task-based language learning and communicative practices a reality in the classroom and how to really transform from the earlier days of just rote grammar translation and whatnot. I think we've, we've come a long way as a field. Um, but homework, on the other hand, has often felt like just something we can't touch, that whatever the textbook publishers give us as exercises, we, can, we just assign them and the kids go off and do it. But since it's so much easier for us to control and think about, I think a lot of our attention and focus has really been left on implementing uh, better solutions for in the classroom, which, which is great that we're headed that direction and making those improvements there. But you know, if we have a situation where maybe a kid comes and has half an hour of homework and 50 minutes of classroom, then it's kind of unfortunate if we don't think at all about that 30 minutes and all the different possibilities we can have there. I think mean, it's especially unfortunate in uh, this day and age where when kids go home and they, they're they just confronted with so many great options for different media activities they could be engaging in, online worlds where they could be learning just a huge range of skills with different people and just such a rich life and culture if they're trying to contrast that with just you know a standard assignment worksheet that they have to do for homework. Um, I think that this gap is getting wider and wider between what kids are capable of engaging with and expecting at home and what we often provide as homework solutions. And so, and that's one area that I think can be greatly improved by looking at video game technologies and what is evolving in other aspects of their lives and trying to think through how we can create solutions for language learning that involve that. So, I mean, with that, I just wanted to start by, just so we're all on the same page, so to speak, um, looking through what the standard homework experience is like for kids here in the U.S. in a foreign language class and then from there think forward about what the different possibilities are that we may not yet be encountering. Um, later I'll get into more video game stuff that isn't related to homework, um, some tie-ins with classroom. I think ultimately what we want to do is get the homework and the classwork all integrated into one unit and that video game technologies have a huge uh, role to play in that and lots of potential. Um, but just as a starting point, I thought I'd start by just uh, running through the homework experience and trying to think through together what the possibilities are for that. So this is one of the typical homework assignments taken from one of the most popular German textbooks in the United States. Uh, particularly in the state of California, I think this book is used by the entire University of California system, as well as numerous German classes all throughout the U.S. So here the students are given a diagram of a person with all of the different parts of the body labeled. Uh, they then get a diagram with just numbers for different body parts where they're supposed to use the other diagram as a reference and then write in all of the answers. 
and then this continues for you know different subject matters for everyday vocabulary first body parts and this is a picture of somebody in a room where you have to just look at a reference diagram and write in the vocabulary for all the different furniture that the person might want. Now what's surprising is there's actually a really big overlap between the goals that we've uh, seen in the assignments before the ones about learning the different body parts and uh, furnishing the house and whatnot and some of the video games that kids are playing outside of class just purely for fun for their own motivation uh, just the video games tend to do it a lot better <laughs> in a lot of cases what you're seeing now is some video from a game called The Sims 2 it's not the case that I just picked a game that happens to match what I was talking about this is actually the most popular video game series in history uh, the best selling ever so, I mean, this really represents the core of what a lot of kids are doing with video games outside of school. So, um, this, is a, this video game has been a really interesting challenge for a lot of the stereotypical notions of video games, where we've typically thought of a game being about um, running around with a gun shooting things, or it were like arcade style, having a spaceship flying through, blowing things up. Um, this game, it, it, it's actually a simulation of just everyday life. You, you have a family, uh, different people, and you just tell them the everyday mundane chores you want them to do. Go eat, go take out the trash, take a shower, go to school, um, you know, just live your everyday life. And this actually turns out to be the most popular video game out there. So, I mean, just to take a step back for a second, I guess, I mean, it's a little unfair to be putting these things side by side. Certainly. Nobody in the textbook industry is trying to claim right now that their homework assignments are full-scale, ready to compete with modern video games at the same level. And, I mean, to its credit, the publishing industry has been trying as best it can to incorporate some games and richer offerings into its homework assignments. Um, but I, I'm worried that we're still falling way short of what we could be doing, and there's a lot of potential to, in practical ways and even on small educational budgets, be more meaningfully incorporating a lot of the spirit of what kids are getting in their video game lives outside of school uh, in with the experiences that we try to create for them in the educational world. So I guess as a starting point we can uh, just examine together uh, some of the games at Quia.com. At least in the US, uh, Quia is one of the biggest partners that the textbook industry uses for providing homework assignments as video games and uh, interactive activities and whatnot. So if we can just look through them. So this first example is from their Hangman generation uh, package that they use to create a series of Hangman games. Um, it's a pretty simple set of rules and I assume pretty familiar. I don't need to explain to anybody what's going on in this game that you're seeing. But uh, what's important to note here is that although it's a game about words, there's nothing connected to the meaning of the words. You can go through this whole game, you, we've just played uh, around, you can see a word on the screen, you may or may not know what that word means, and you can go through the whole game only knowing how things are spelled, but it has no connection to any context or meaning of the words. So this here is an example of the battleship games that you can also generate with the Quia suite. Um, this, I think, is representative of a much larger problem and one of the key th issues that we need to face when we think about doing video games and homework assignments for foreign language learning. Namely, that at the beginning you're just playing Battleship. You have a game that has no connection whatsoever to the language. And then suddenly you're thrown into another mode where you're focused just on the language itself and you're answering a vocabulary question. And if you answer the question right, the game goes on, and if not, you lose some points. But there's really fundamentally no connection whatsoever between the learning side of things and the gameplay side of things. And the end result for students is that they obviously would just prefer to play the game of their choice outside and then come and really focus in on school and do the work, rather than play with an educational game where essentially what we're doing is we're taking you know all of the fun of a bad lecture and combining it with all of the educational value of a bad video game. We're kind of taking the worst of both worlds and just forcing them to play them together, rather than the intended effect. So, I mean, obviously it would be very easy to just keep you going on, pointing out you know, all of the examples of bad language learning video games out there and to just criticize them and uh, just complain about the different flaws we have, but I'm assuming it'll be much more interesting for you guys and more constructive if we start thinking about 
what are some practical ways in which we actually can make better language learning solutions out there. Um, so with that, I wanted to share, uh, starting with some of the theoretical work that we've done here at MIT for laying the foundation for this, and then get into the actual implementation. So on the theoretical side, uh, what we've done is we've authored this paper. It's called uh, 10 Key Principles for Foreign Language Learning Video Games. Uh, if you Google it, it'll be the first thing that comes up. And essentially what we've done is we've kind of looked at the culture around video games and what the expectations are and all the different elements that separate out uh, the video games people expect to play versus kind of some of the things that you just saw with Hangman and Battleship, etc. Um, and we've also gone through the task-based language learning literature and the relevant theoretical work in the field and tried to think through with what are the key principles that are necessary to align both video game design and language learning and what should we focus on most practically without you know needing to get into million dollar budgets and just create like the, the wildest video games we've designed we can think of more you know what should we focus on to be key to making effective language learning video games so uh, there's 10 principles in here and I'm going to focus first on just the first key one, which I think is the most important shift we need to make in our thinking uh, and probe our perspectives. And so that's this principle. <clears throat> At least as much thought needs to go into the design for failure states as well as success states. Uh, and so just even f separate from language learning, this is a huge, pr hugely important principle for designing good learning games or just games in general. Uh, Will Wright, the creator of The Sims and many other uh, top-selling games, really attributes the way that he thinks about failure as why his games are so successful and where he puts the most thought when designing a game. When we do games now, we very much think in terms of what are the interaction loops, what are the success and failure side of those interaction loops. And one thing that's kind of non-intuitive here is that it's actually more important, we've found, to really think through the failure side than the success side. Because when you think about really the success side here is pretty boring. You know, you really want to get to the next level. And you're going to spend most of your time failing. And it's kind of important that the failures are interesting and varied, and primarily that you understand why the failure occurred. So if the sim falls to the ground and starves to death, you kind of understand, oh, I need to feed the guy. Um, and then you can kind of avoid that failure next time, and maybe you encounter a different failure. So one of the things we did in The Sims is we really wanted to populate the game with a lot of different failure states that were fairly obvious, entertaining, done in kind of a comic way. Um, the players actually were very much on our side there, and this is something we've seen a lot, is that once you kind of get players on board with the world and they believe in the illusion of reality of what you're building, um, they will actually kind of go to great lengths to, to keep that illusion of reality to the point where we, they were seeing bugs in the game and taking screenshots of bugs, and they were just interpreting them as new failure states. And they said, oh, it makes perfect sense. We had a bug where every now and then the Sims would catch on fire for no apparent reason. And they decided that, oh, that's cool. It's like spontaneous human combustion. I didn't know they had programmed that. You know, and so... You know. So certainly within the field of video game design, it's become clear to us just what a dramatic difference it makes when we rethink our notions of failure and we get away from this idea that when the player makes a mistake or messes up in any way that we just tell them, like, you failed, try again, or like, you didn't do what you were supposed to do, but that we instead uh, show them that we had expected full well that they were going to fail, that it's a natural process, and that we put some effort into making that creative and interesting for them. Um, it, it's really amazing what a complete change of experience that is for the player and how they engage with the game differently. There's a really interesting set of neurological studies where they did uh, different readings of the brain while playing a game called Super Monkey Ball. Um, I can send that to anybody who's interested, email me. Um, but the basic point is that when we rethink how we portray failure in games and that we give the player the notion that we expected them to fail and that we put thought into it ourselves because it's such a natural process that it just really fundamentally makes much better games and is one of the key lessons that industry has learned. And so my hope is that going forward um, the foreign language learning community can also undergo a similar change. I mean that certainly any good teacher will naturally in a classroom when it, it makes a mistake not just be like, no, wrong, you're bad. Um, but think of really interesting and creative ways to create a dynamic about it. And I, I also think that that's probably one of the hallmarks of a good teacher. But certainly, I think our curriculum and our media that support foreign language learning 
and it doesn't necessarily reflect that and it's logical that when it does it will also um, you know portray the same benefits that a good teacher handling that can do uh, particularly I th what I've noticed in some of these learning games when we do make failure interesting is that kids get to the point where if they make a mistake oftentimes they will purposely make mistakes just to see what's there and see what an interesting thing is and, and be thinking like, wow, cool. And then, you know, it, or if they do make a mistake, they can always just tell their friends like, oh, I did that on purpose because I knew it would be interesting and there would be something cool. Um, and it, it, it removes the whole pressure of trying to get the right answer. And it gives you a much more relaxed, playful way of just exploring the full range of things. Um, and it, I mean, I think that's a lot more how children learn and get to just a much wider, deeper understanding by seeing how different things work, not just focused on purely getting the right answer, and if you don't get it, just saying, that's wrong. Um, so with that, I wanted to kind of look at a practical example of everything that I've been talking about so far. So what you're seeing now is an experimental test prototype game that I've made um, just to kind of play with some of these ideas and kind of dabble and tinker with um, some thoughts on how we can achieve all this in a realistic manner. Um, and so what this is, is this is a game where you're an alien, it's built directly on top of Google Maps, and so this is the city of Berlin, kind of the city center, and you can fly around, explore different buildings, different parts, and just hang out. But ultimately, your goal is that there's a series of other aliens also flying around the city, and you don't know where they are, you can't find them by yourself. And so what you need to do is you need to interact with all the different people in Berlin who naturally speak only German um, and try to get them to become your friends uh, so that they can help you out in finding the other aliens. And to do that, each of them has a particular kind of mission or quest that they need help with um, before they'll be your friend and help you out. So, um, for example, there's a polar bear if you go over to the zoo who is complaining about how much he dislikes the weather in Berlin and, um, you know, how he misses uh, being in a different climate. So to help him out, what you can do is, um, we're now in the center, there's a cafe over here. We can go there and buy an ice cream for him and give it to him and then he becomes happy and uh, he becomes your friend and he starts helping you out. So what we're gonna do mm -hmm. is go into this cafe. Can I Ihnen etwas zu essen oder trinken bringen? And we're gonna see if we can figure out how to get an ice cream for this polar bear. So the first thing, you know, we don't necessarily know what she's saying. So we can just kind of move the mouse over each piece and see if we can construct it to her in our minds. And hopefully we can piece together this saying, uh, can I bring you anything to eat or drink? So then the next step is we need to kind of think about how we could respond to this in a way that would get us the ice cream. And so here we have a little tool for constructing sentences where we can just leave the cursor over and help us understand the different possibilities. So I'm going to start putting together a sentence. And then I can just play with different options to try and see what the range of things I can say are. Um, and so what's interesting is that, you know, besides, so it's actually a hedgehog, but anyway, um, besides the, you know, normal, just straight, are you saying the right thing to get an ice cream or not? There's also just all sorts of nonsensical things you can do. There's a huge range of stuff you can play with. And it's not the case that it'll just say, like, wrong, you didn't get the ice cream. Um, we can go ahead and try ordering a uh, porcupine or... Wir sind hier in einem Café, nicht im Zoo. Um, and the system will respond. And what's interesting is that these are the you know, these kind of mistakes and kind of funny things and, you know, off the path options are the things that people will remember most and really stick in their head. We can go through and say things like, could I order a glass of, you know, there's all sorts of normal options, uh, orange juice, hot chocolate, but we can also say like gasoline. Um, and this is always the ones that kids will immediately, even if they know what it is, try and say it just because they want to try ordering a glass of gasoline. Uh, and that'll be the word that they remember, much more so than ice cream. Um, you know, so that's one type of mistake that we would normally think of a mistake, that here it's just kind of a fun thing where we can show, like, yeah, we thought about that, that's normal, that's fine, go for it, play with it. Um, and that's the semantic mistakes, kind of, they're grammatically correct sentences, but 
they um, you know they don't make sense within the context and so then it just replies within the context there's the other types of mistakes here are just purely grammatical ones the only log grammatical answer to when the sentence would be bestellen to be able to order a glass of um, gasoline um, but then it's possible that a learner might think that it's possible to say one of these other uh, forms of gebestellen uh, or gebestellt and so for these non-grammatical ones, instead of, you know, if they do pick it saying like, no, sorry, that's wrong, this is the incorrect participle for this form of grammar, when ending in this tense you need to do this, you know, um, and just really breaking from the game and destroying it, they, you can just give very quick feedback where it just goes away and you're done. And it just blows up. And they, they love the effect, they play with it, they start to learn and start to get a sense. And that way... You know, you don't. You, you can always include all of the different options in there, but also n not get distracted by them as they're playing. Um, so now we're going to. Uh, I guess we we still need to get our actual ice cream. So we'll order our uh, ice cream. Noch etwas anderes? Saying still anything else? No, nope, we can leave now. So now we have our ice cream over here. Um, if we did take it to the polar bear, he would get added to our friends list, and he would help us out. Um, I mean, we do that by traveling through, here's the subway system, we can get to the zoo. I'm going to skip that just for time, we'll stay uh, where we are, explore some of the other options around here. Um, so we can go back down, we'll help out this guy here. So... Meine Zeichnung passt nicht mit meiner Geschichte. Können Sie es war einmal ein Schneemann und er bewachte eine Menge Karotten, welche über ihm schwebten. Ein Hase kam und versuchte ihn zu säubern. So here it's giving a little story, saying, uh, There once was a snowman who was watching a bunch of carrots which were floating over him. A rabbit came and tried to clean him up. And so, you know, here's some the carrots, but they don't necessarily match the rest of the story. The carrots aren't floating over him, the rabbit isn't yet trying to clean him. And so what we need to do is give all the imperatives um, to get this picture to match. And so to do that, we can explore kind of all the different ways of using indirect and direct objects in German. Um, you can, there's multiple forms of constructing it. So, you know, we can say give, uh, and then we can just explore through and say give a hairdryer to the rat. And then, we can, and then it updates the picture to match that. And we think, well, that doesn't really match cleaning. That's not the right thing. So let's take... A, so again, wrong grammatical forms. The hairdryer away. Okay, give the rabbit. Uh, that was sword. Uh, mop. Now, we're reading part of the picture there, we're about to run out of time, Mind. but you get the idea. Um, it, we're basically able to use language to individually construct sentences, think how to piece it all together in order to um, interact with the system and see all of the results, be they right or wrong, funny or whatnot, everything has meaning to it. It's not just kind of drilling you on if you already know something or not, it's giving you a space to explore and play with. So just jumping back to the theory for a second, um, there's two other principles that I wanted to just kind of highlight and think through about what we had just seen. So the first new principle is here at number two. It says that instruction needs to ensure that learners focus predominantly on meaning. Secondarily, however, instruction should still include focus on form. So for the non-theorists out there, we'll break that down in a little bit, but just also skipping ahead to number four. It says, metalinguistic descriptions and terminology should be presented through optional supporting material, not as part of the core gameplay. So let's step through both of these and what they really mean. If we think about the game that we just saw, the first encounter we had was a question, basically, can I bring you anything to eat or drink? So we were still thinking about the context, this was a real world question, we were thinking about the meaning in the full sentence. So this is what we're calling focus on meaning that the player is being asked to use language as a way of communicating meaning and portraying real-life usage. 
Um, they didn't come into this game, okay, here's going to be an encounter about question formation, or here's going to be an encounter about, uh, you know, gender on nouns, or or here's a vocabulary drill on individual words or pieces of sentences that are disconnected from their larger context. Um, this was everything all together as a natural language piece. At the same time, we didn't just leave it at that and dump the player with kind of what they would get if they were stuck in the country with no supports to break it down and understand what's going on and how to think about the language. This is where we start to get also into principle four, where we're kind of reshifting what we're thinking of grammar as. You know, I think a lot of people have the stereotypical notion that grammar and grammar teaching needs to be about uh, memorizing all of these Latin terms for different language phenomena and conveying that. Whereas I, I would like to get to the point where we conceptualize grammar as being the way that pieces of language are put together to form meanings in ways that are different from just their individual pieces. And so here we're starting to express that by giving them all of the individual pieces they need to form a sentence, but then having the computer make the interface and construct the environment where they can see visually all the relationships between how they're putting the sentence together and what that um, contributes to the larger structure of the sentence and how that limits other possibilities in the sentence and exploring in ways that we haven't necessarily been able to do without a computer how language is put together. And so we're trying to put that as the centerpiece of what grammar is and refocus things. And so now we have both focus on meaning, that's what we had uh, at the beginning, just the whole game structure is around the meaning. And I feel we have focus on form here, where we're showing all of the different pieces, but we're not necessarily doing it in the ways that people are used to of, okay, now let's memorize uh, you know these Latin terms. So what's important in this model is that Players who already know the concepts and just want to be continuing with the game and reinforcing the meaning can very quickly construct the sentence they want. They don't need to go through, okay, which part of grammar is this? What's, how do I meta break this down? If they already know the concepts, then they can go and breeze right through the game. At the same time, we can go beyond just the focus on form that we've shown here. And when players opt that it's going to be helpful for them and that they need more support, they can leave the mouse over whatever individual piece that they're interested in and get full targeted support. I mean, here there's just a picture of a glass to help with the vocabulary, but the same principle could be used to include whatever grammatical information. At this point, we could say, like, okay, while well, the player is having trouble understanding this word, now let's break it down. We'll include uh, an explanation about why this word only came out of ein because it's a neutral word and why all the words coming off of it can be all sorts of genders. Um, because, you know, it's a container word for these words and why it's got this position in this sentence and, you know, all the different grammatical forms that can come out of this and give them all of this extra information here when they opt for it, when it's not going to be disruptive. But we're using all of the different possibilities within the computer's interface to help guide this process and separate out these layers of so focus on meaning first, focus on form, without necessarily metalinguistic explanations, just visual and whatever new media possibilities we have. And then finally, as it's opted, the full spectrum of metalinguistic support. So before leaving this game, um, there's just one other point I want to kind of touch upon, and that is how we think about teaching culture in our foreign language classes. So at one extreme, um, again, you can see this is the same textbook we'd seen before. This is one way that sometimes we think about culture in foreign language classrooms. Um, hopefully not always. Uh, in the center, there's a picture of some two Muslim women dressed in you know full body burqas and they're buying some lemons. And it says like, immigrants bring the culture and traditions of their homelands with them to Germany. And there's a series of similar pictures. And this is kind of the section on culture where it's trying to distill down like, almost bulleted point facts about uh, Germany and culture as the way of having a chapter about culture. But I worry that um, you know, this and other ways of portraying culture kind of missed the whole point of why it's so important to t bring culture into a language classroom. Um, I think one of the key things we should be striving for, I mean, certainly not the only one, and there's other aspects of high culture and whatnot we want to include, 
but one of the key things we should be trying to do with culture, I feel, is always trying to get the learner more connected to the country, have them more almost emotionally invested in what they're learning, and really personally interested in the culture that they're you know, working to become a part of through their language and identity. So one technique often advocated in the communicative literature is to use basically authentic materials and whatever you're doing try and go to the actual culture, get actual materials, bring them into the classroom and use those. Um, I think with video games we have a step to actually go one step further and to use real live materials, you know, not just stuff that we have uh, curated out of the foreign culture, selected, brought in and turned into a curriculum that we can actually draw from the actual real-time live data and systems that are being used in the other culture as part of our activities. So we saw that as an example um, in this game where we're building the game on top of Google Maps itself, the same Google Maps that's being used in Germany and the same way that people would build applications on top of it. We're doing the same here um, for the language learning game. Um, I mean, that's a very basic example. Certainly you could go into the actual street view data and you know see the live streets and the different people and then go into, let's say, Craigslist or like an, a house hunting website or a job finding website and populate the maps with real live data that's written by actual people in the foreign culture at that actual time that the kids can actually respond to and get into conversations with people in the foreign culture, ideally um, at their same peer age level and whatnot. Uh, so there's all sorts of opportunities to take the whole concept of authentic materials even further into live materials as we learn how to build these games and uh, educational opportunities on top of just actual real world stuff out there. So I mean that's an exciting possibility for research that I think we'll hopefully be exploring in the coming years, um, though at this point there's not a whole lot. More of what we've had so far are sites like this, where you can log on and say, like, I speak English, and I want to find somebody out there who speaks Spanish, and search, and, you know, get a list of different people in different countries that you can talk to and kind of directly ask them about the culture and uh, get to know from a person. Seems to be kind of the first intuition that everybody had when the internet came about in terms of how we could uh, bring this towards language learning. So I think this is a good start, and the basic concept is good. Um, I think the trouble with sites like this is that you find a partner, and then you end up in these conversations where it's, you don't really have any reason for talking to them other than that you found them for this reason. Um, and so you get into conversations where it's like, okay, I like chocolate ice cream. What about you? Uh, yeah, um, well, I like vanilla ice cream. Um, you know, and especially when people's language proficiency is stunted, it becomes really hard for them to get into meaningful conversations. And so, I mean, it, it's a great start and people enjoy it and sometimes they take off. But there's certainly the opportunity to engineer and construct you know, more engaging, meaningful dialogue and to have better results than what we've got so far.
So uh, communities like the ones Rebecca Black talks about, they're pretty prevalent on the internet. And I think they're great for informal learning. Uh, I think video games have a really good opportunity for us to actually construct these environments that will work for you know a large group of students and to really control and navigate things. Um, just in terms of my own personal experiences, something I found really interesting was I was playing this online game called Travian, where uh, you see it on the screen there. I'm just going to log in. And it's a really simple online game. You know, it's nothing that is really hard to install or support. It's just really basic. Um, and yet it has, at one point, I think half a million players, you know, people still find it really enjoyable and fun, and despite all the simplicity, and the simplicity makes it really manageable in a classroom. Um, but basically what the game is this, I have my own little village here, uh, there's all sorts of ways I can build it up, I can put little buildings in, um, you know, there's all these different things I can construct, I'm going to start constructing a little wall around the outside of my building, and now it's in the process of constructing. Um, and so there's just little ways that I can manage and control my village. But what's interesting is that there's a map, all these other villages are other people who have made little villages around mine. And it looks small on this map, but this map is huge. There's, you know, tens of thousands of little villages all surrounding this map. And all of uh, these people all around the world are playing in this game. And so ultimately, once you get going on your village, what you have to start doing is learn about who your neighbors are and you know what they're up to and try to talk with them and make allies with them or coordinate with them and so really the core of the game takes place here in the message writing where you're just simply writing to all of the other people in the world trying to understand what's going on with their village and how you can either work together or defend or you know what different actions you want to take with one another and so when I was playing uh, we had an interesting situation where you know there was a set of villages with a bunch of people in Hong Kong who were much stronger than us and they were about to invade and kill us. Uh, on the side there was also a group of villages from Poland who, um, you know, if we combined together we could hold off the Hong Kong people but individually the Hong Kong people would easily take both of us. And so what we had to do was try to convince the Polish, Polish people to help us out um, for their own interest against the Hong Kong people. Um, and so we would be sitting there writing messages and whatnot, but their English was really not so great. And so we spent most of the time trying to make friends with them, trying to help them with their English, just to communicate and to really get across. And it was fine with us. We were really motivated. We found it fun. You know, we didn't c consider it going, oh, okay, we'll have to take a break to teach them English or whatever. It was, we just didn't think about it. We were just helping them along because we really cared about wanting to work together to defend our villages from the people in Hong Kong. And yet, at the same time, they were, um, you know, with us trying to learn the language and really enjoying that experience. And so, you know, this is just one example of a game that I've personally played. But I think you can go online and find all sorts of great games out there. If you just search, um, the genre would be cas casual MMO. Um, and you can read up about different ones out there that might suit your purposes uh, or you, you know you, you could always email me and look through but I think these kind of really simple online flash games uh, lend themselves to a lot of potential for creating communities in classrooms and getting kids to want to write to real people out there and motivated and to write properly because there's actual people reading. Uh, personally I definitely think that the most practical entry point for thinking about how we get video games into the foreign language learning process is by using flash games like the ones we've been seeing so far, just really simple games um, that are still fun, that have all the core elements of a game while incorporating all of the key principles we talked about for uh, bringing in language learning. Uh, at the same time though, I know there's also some researchers out there in the audience and I wanted to just point out that there is another option for how we get to these games, which is to take the more complex, fully blown 3D, etc. games and simply make modifications to them. You know, when we see a game out there, we feel like it's just locked down and closed and, and it is what it is and we have to use it as it is. But games nowadays are actually really surprisingly easy to edit. And with that, there's a lot of possibilities to make all sorts of edits to make games more um, friendly for language learning. 
So for example, The Sims 2 it has a little tool where you can go in um, that's displayed right now and edit all of the language data used in the game. And with this, we can create a version that you can see here where it's specifically designed to help language learners and annotates all sorts of words that they may not know and give kind of just-in-time help to guide them through any unfamiliar language in the game. So that's just to say another possibility to think about how we get from where we are now to meaningfully bringing in video games. So, so far I guess I've just kind of thrown all sorts of different angles for things related to video games and language learning just from all over the place. Um, I'm guessing some people might be feeling a little overwhelmed trying to make sense of some of the different pieces. So ideally at this point I would have liked to be able to kind of bring it back down into some concrete steps and just real simple paths for teachers to take. Um, the unfortunate truth of the matter is there just really isn't a lot out there right now in its current form uh, for in terms of good language learning video game solutions. Um, I mean, I, I feel like it's almost inexcusable that we've, we're left still so prevalently with hot potatoes and things like the hangman and other crossword type ex activities kind of dominating the core of a lot of what's considered video games or games and online activities for um, language learning homework. Um, I mean, the Google Maps game that you saw earlier with um, the cafe and the menus for constructing sentences for the snowman and rabbit game and whatnot, that's all stuff that I had done just as a hobby on the side, and my degree is in linguistics. There's far better programmers out there than me. So I think it's, it's a real shame that um, we don't even have stuff at that level yet when there's a, a whole industry around this kind of thing. So I, I really hope that we can start demanding more and set some basic uh, foundations for what we would like to see. But in the meantime, really the best solution is to be using the games out there. And just, as I said, the really simple flash-based games, uh, some of them even like cybernations.net or .com, one or the other, are just web-based games that have just fun, great mechanics that it's very easy for any teacher to be start to see, like, wow, okay, I understand how I could take the correspondence the kids are having in this game with real English speakers around the world, bring that into the classroom, create activities around that where students can share with one another what their uh, character or nation or whatever the um, aspect of the game is, is doing in the game and how they're interacting with one another and, you know, create this support environment within the classroom for activities outside of the classroom where people can play these real world games with one another. Um, so for now that's unfortunately kind of where we're at. I'm hoping that just there's so much potential for creating stuff layered on top of that that explicitly is made for language learning, um, but we're really just starting on that. So in terms of giving a peek at what's coming up, I wanted to show just really quickly, uh, I know we're running short on time and I want to make sure I leave time for questions, so I'm not going to go into details for this site but one that unfortunately right now there's not a whole lot there it's just in very very early development um, but if you keep checking back at this site over the next like six nine months hopefully there'll be more there that um, you can start to really get involved in in terms of actual games really made for language learning so so this here is a site called Xenos Isle um, it's a world done by a group out here called the Learning Games Network that's specifically targeted for foreign language learning. But the hope is to make games that are fun enough that even people not trying to learn a language would want to come and play, and you'll have a community mixed of language learners and just people looking for fun games, um, but primarily language learners. So I'm going to sign in. And then I'm going to this island where um, I, th I believe later on you'll be able to kind of navigate around and interact with different people in the world all throughout this island. Right now there's three dots that you can click on that all correspond to different games that you can play. Um, and so, you know, you go into the world, that, as I said, it's still under heavy development. But ultimately, in this world, as you meet people through playing all these different games with one another, uh, you'll have all sorts of opportunities to both make friends and practice your language. So, as I said, um, for time reasons and the fact that these are multiplayer games, I'm not going to go too in-depth in them, and also right now they're still under development. But I would definitely encourage you to, if you, if you can get a group of people, most of the games have a minimum of three players, 
But if you can get a group of people, um, you know, a few months from now, I'd encourage you to check these games out and try them and see if they might be effective for your classrooms. So those are some exciting directions for teachers and practitioners to keep an eye on. Um, hopefully as that emerges, there'll be more interesting stuff there for you guys to be able to incorporate in. Um, I guess for researchers out there trying to think about what the future is and you know where to look and what's coming, uh, I guess there's two areas that have really been of interest to me, kind of uh, mobile learning and autonomous learning. So, I mean, with mobile learning, just the phenomenal advancements going on in cell phones right now, the Android platform, and as it's evolving, kind of the ability for Flash to export to the iPhone, uh, it, I think is going to open up so many doors for rethinking how we approach language learning. I mean, so far, of what we've got right now is constrained to be very textual based on kind of the fact that it's been distributed and disseminated through textbooks and audio, audio materials have been so difficult before and now with cell phones you know audio material can be delivered directly over the air and heard anywhere um, and as we start to integrate that with the textual stuff and interactive components I think there's just huge potential for you know, pushing the bounds of what we've thought of language learning so far. Uh, the other one, autonomous learning, I think it's kind of problematic that a lot of the tradition we teach with right now is about completing exercises and assignments and you know it's it's a step by step progression where the concept of learning is something that happens because it's assigned to you to go and do it and you sit down and you force your way to do it rather than you just immerse yourself in a new culture the new media of, of that culture etc and you just start to understand how you use different tools to break down language and learn yourself so uh, one direction I'm working on right now, kind of the thrust of uh, my extracurricular uh, fun hobby research, is to look into how we can be creating games that teach students not just the language as they're playing the games, but can bring in you know dynamic content and get them to be engaged with all sorts of ways of learning autonomously and to make it just a part of their regular life and to blur the lines between learning and you know what they would normally be doing otherwise and to teach them the skills to get there through the games that I'm hoping to create. So unfortunately, um, I mean, A, we're running kind of late on time and B, that stuff is all kind of way too early to be um, have anything really I could visibly show. But certainly um, researchers out there, if you want to ch check in kind of half a year from now, I'd be happy to talk with it. Or if any of you are ever in the Boston area, um, please let me know. It'd be great to chat and uh, see how this stuff is relevant to you and um, as it all emerges. So I guess with that, um, and as I notice we're kind of running, I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for questions. So I guess I will open it up and switch over to the live webcam.